people who know me know that I never give a PowerPoint presentation because uh, PowerPoint is Satan. Um, <laughs> this is my idea of a PowerPoint presentation. Um, uh, uh, so uh, I, I'm going to suggest uh, that we should approach it, a free, free will in a different way, and I'd like to give a different explanation for why we feel free um, than the ones that have been given for actually thousands of years. Um, I should say that, that I, I, I consulted with a lot of philosophers, including Jeremy Butterfield, who was my MPhil supervisor for history and philosophy of science at, at uh, Cambridge University. And if I learned one thing from him, that you should be precise, and when talking about philosophical issues, you should actually hold back and try to make things not as grand as you might. So I'm not going to explain free will itself. I'm not going to define free will. I'm not going to say whether we have it. However, I wish to explain the uh, sensation or the phenomenon which I believe is at the heart of free will, which is our inability to predict our future decisions. Like at 4 o'clock, I said, coffee's out, caffeinated or decaf? Well, for me, that's actually a rough decision at 4 o'clock because the caffeine is more excited, but it also could have negative effects later on in the evening. So <clears throat> let me actually just go through this explanation because I, I have very little time. So. Um, for thousands of years, uh, people have actually argued about free will in the context of whether the laws of physics are deterministic or indeterministic. So for example, Lucretius, uh, sorry, Epicurus, uh, this was reported by Lucretius in De Rerum Naturae. Epicurus said, wow, everything's atomistic, the atoms move around, everything's deterministic, except every now and then one of the atoms gives a small swerve. Why does it give a small swerve? Because otherwise we wouldn't have free will. Now I've got a great Lucretius quote, but I'm not going to give it to you because there's no time. No jokes, no time, no questions. So, so that's what I said. Yeah, that's what George told me. OK, however, when Newton came up with his uh, uh, Newtonian laws of physics, they were deterministic. And that caused a huge problem for philosophers for the next 300 years, basically. Uh, because uh, if everything's deterministic, where's the freedom in that? Eh? OK. So um, actually, uh, the first I did a lot of historical research in this. And the first uh, uh, indication that that, that actually James Clerk Maxwell, in a paper in like 1885 or something, actually said, look, my laws of electrodynamics exhibit sensitive dependence on initial conditions, and therefore this might be enough to save free will. So sorry, Marcelo, it wasn't your idea. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so uh, uh, this is, and then when quantum mechanics came in, Eddington pointed out, hey, quantum mechanics adds real randomness, and thus, Physics withdraws its objection to free will. It was a grandiose thing. OK, but does randomness actually save free will? And many people have chatted about this, OK? My claim is that actually this question about determinism and randomness, which goes in philosophy under compatibilism and incompatibilism, really doesn't have much to do with free will. What is free will? Or rather, not free will in general, sorry. This sensation, our inability to predict our own actions and our own decisions. Let me just talk about that. Where does that come from? Well, I mean, as, uh, as was pointed out by Marcelo, that, that you know, now we've got these neuroscientists, these are neuroscientists, poke around in our brain, know what we're going to decide like a few minutes or a few seconds before we do it. So they go walk around saying, hey, we don't have free will. Actually, Stephen Hawking says this as well in one of his books. I had a good Hawking quote about this. Completely wrong. He was a poor brain. I mean, come on, a poor brain, all right? So why is this not true? I claim that the origins of our inability to predict ourselves lie in the halting problem. Here is a Turing machine. The Turing machine is simulating itself, simulating itself, simulating itself all the way down the line like, and you know, what the heck is that? So the halting problem, what is the halting problem? If we have a Turing machine and it starts to ask itself questions, it says, will I ever be able to answer the question of whether I'll be able to answer the question? Da, 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 da. Hmm. I wonder what the answer is. <coughs> And I claim, and I will give some strong evidence, and in fact, some mathematical theorems. I will not show you the theorems, but basically this result gives a mathematical theorem that proves it, that shows that this is the basis for our inability to decide what's going on. So in fact, if you have finite resources, so Turing halting problems come to having infinite resources. Let's look at finite resources. Here's a rather attractive, I, I believe, woman contemplating modeling herself, <laughs> <laughs> thinking about herself, thinking about what she's going to do, and you see, just to be able to draw this in two dimensions, I had to make the things in the thought bubbles less detailed than the thing, her, than the woman herself. 
And that's because if you try to model yourself, your models will be less detailed than you, you are yourself. And there's a very nice set of theorems from computer science that capture this beautifully that says that simulating yourself is either slower, less detailed, chancier, or all of the above than actually being yourself. And the nice computer science version of this is called the hartmann stearns theorem, a beautiful, as Scott will tell you, beautiful theorem from computer science from 1961 or sometime like that, um, uh, which says that predict, to predict with certainty what you will decide to do an hour from now is, takes more than an hour. It takes more computational resources because asking you the question, you're something like, gee, what am I going to be doing in an hour is like a lot slower than just doing it, okay? So, and this is true, okay? So this, so sometimes any system that can actually contemplate, ask itself the question, what am I gonna do in an hour, often won't be able to answer that. This is true whether the universe is deterministic or probabilistic, irregular or chaotic, classical, quantum mechanical. These are my like kind of teeth herring like pictures of a quantum, quantum thing with like little <laughs> And so I'd like to propose, and by the way, this is in a, a, I have a paper on this published in the, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, where all the theorems and everything are presented in gory detail. It's called a Turing Test for Free Will. You'll find it on the archive. There was a good <coughs> slash dot conversation about this a few months, a month ago. Um, a Turing Test for Free Will. So let's like, like ask these questions. This is a self-administered test, right? Because like, unlike the real Turing Test, you, know, you should give it to yourself because if you cheat, you have only yourself to blame. Who are you hurting? Just you yourself, okay? Are you a decider? So are you making a decision? Can you model your behavior and maybe that of other things around you? And then the last one is can I predict my own decisions? And that of course is a trick question because, oh sorry, because uh, you won't be able to do this. If you answer the first two questions correctly, you cannot do the third. This is just a mathematical theorem about anything that is trying to predict itself. And let me give it as an example, George is about to kill me. Let me give it as an example, this is a very important example suggested to me by Jerry Sussman, the operating system of a computer. So does the operating system of a computer have a sense of self-reference? Yes, the operating of a system of a computer allocates flops, you know, machine cycles and memory space to other programs, but it allocates it to all programs, including itself. So let's suppose it's program number 42, right? And so it's always asking the question, well, what does, you know, what kind of resources does program number 42 need, you know, a few microseconds down the road, and it tries to estimate what those resources are. So it has a sense of self-reference, extremely rudimentary, you know, hey, here's program 42, it happens to be me, okay? But it doesn't, you know, not enough conscious or anything like that. Um, well, I don't know, some people might think that, but not conscious, so it says, okay, you know, what am I going to do? It won't be able to predict what it's going to do. This is just a theorem. You know, it's a computer science theorem. All right, it's not, it's not some like, uh, I don't know. Anyway, okay, so who will pass? Thermostat, no. One state, two, two states, off or on, not enough bits to even simulate itself out of a paper bag. Dogs and cats, maybe, sure. We don't know. I would think, I think so. Little plankton, you know, bioluminescent plankton. Trees, probably not, okay. so. But yes, computers, smartphones, they have this capacity in their operating systems to predict their own future behavior. They cannot predict their own future behavior. And I look forward very soon to the smartphone free will app. And I should say that my wife had made me get a smartphone so I could teach her how to use a smartphone. And I, I asked Siri, I said, so Siri, when the lecture is over, do you want to go get a beer? And Siri said, Seth, this is about you, not about me.